Now, most of you associate me with our, our for-profit patient advocacy company, North Shore Patient Advocates. And we've been around since 2011 and do complex care management in the Chicagoland area. Um, but today I wanna to talk about, um, about a, a real mission of mine and it's a new company that I started to meet the needs of the lower income clients and those that eventually are going to need guardianship. About a year, year and a half ago, we started noticing a, a real uptick in the number of senior orphans and people that we've been caring for for years that were losing cognitive capacity and um, they didn't have any family at all so um, I just felt like I really wanted to be able to still care for them because it was like family we were very close to our clients and um, and our tagline of North Shore is it's like having a nurse in the family. And um, right now we have a new company called Seniors Alone Guardianship and Advocacy Services. Now that company does essentially the same level of complex care management um, that North Shore does only at a lower um, cost. We use a, a sliding scale fee service. Um, people do have to have some resources to be able to um, afford our sliding scale, but we, we range anywhere from 100 to $175 an hour, depending upon their capacity. And um, the North Shore Patient Advocates right now, our standard rate is 225 an hour. What we do is pretty high level. Um, we go into intensive care units, we do virtual advocacy, and the guardianship work I'm finding is very, very hard. Um, when we have <clears throat> adults with disabilities that have serious mental illness and sometimes even um, uh, polysubstance abuse, it's very, very um, difficult to get them to not harm themselves or harm others sometimes. And um, we've had some really, really challenging cases. We've had some really good wins and we've also had some really sad cases. So one of our, our, our very first clients <clears throat> was a 52-year-old woman who um, I was contacted by a hospital in Chicago because um, her family really could not care for her anymore. She had harmed her adult children and her husband so much financially and emotionally. And the last thing she did was um, set herself on fire in front of her husband in their house. And the house um, burned, um, had extensive fire damage. And um, she got third degree burns all over her body, but they couldn't place her. So they called me because they know that we take, um, we take really <clears throat> difficult to place clients. Um, we take violent clients, those with serious mental illness, and we get them into a safe um, community and get them stabilized. But this particular woman, um, she just never, she had a serious, serious uh, bipolar disease and none of the medications could ever really work with her. We got her in a beautiful supportive living facility. She got medication management, but nothing really helped. She cried every day that we knew her because she had lost her family and her family would have absolutely no contact with her because they had been doing this for 20 years. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> last um, Thursday or last um, fall, last October, November, she was looking at going through her first uh, season of the holidays without the client, without the client's family, and she just couldn't take it. So she reached out to her, her um, soon-to-be ex-husband by text, and, um, and he did not respond. Um, she just really didn't have it in her head that she would never be able to have a relationship with her family. So she walked out of the supportive living facility she got an Uber, she went down to um, downtown Chicago and, um, and she climbed to the seventh floor of Water Tower Place and she jumped to her death. And um, that was heartbreaking. I mean, we just, we were heartbroken over that, but it was a real wake up call to me that, that there are some really, really serious people out there that need help. And it made me even more committed to trying my best to help people um, that we have. So we've got several guardianship cases right now, and most of them are doing extremely well. 
Um, one of them is uh, dual diagnosis polysubstance abuse, 45-year-old um, um, man that has been completely uncooperative for the last eight months. So we're going to be turning him over to a different, um, a different guardian that has more experience with severely uncooperative mentally ill clients and and hopefully he'll be able to have more success with this man so we know um, our capacity and um, and we work very collaboratively I have a psych nurse I have care, care managers we have social workers and um, I love having the reputation of doing the most complex care management possible um, with our clients and we've we've had some really good cases during this COVID pandemic. I've found to um, my, my pleasant surprise that we're able to do about 95% of what we did before virtually. Um, I got a call from a 92-year-old woman whose 94-year-old dementia husband had fallen at home and he went into the hospital right at the beginning, the height of everything. And you guys know what that was like. It was like the Wild West. Nobody knew the rules. They were changing every day. And um, it was really, really difficult. So this man, <clears throat> we wanted to get him out of the hospital as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, the uh, COVID committee at this hospital would not do a COVID test. They said, if he doesn't have any symptoms, then we're not going to do a test. So that made it almost impossible for me to place him. So, um, so we worked for four or five days with the care management department of the hospital. And I was thinking, you know, that that he was medically stable for discharge days earlier. So I was wondering in my head, is this hospital going to have to eat all of this money for this man sitting in a bed because we can't place him? I mean, they wanted to send him to um, a poor quality um, sniff, and I knew that he would be um, much safer in a zero um, COVID um, community for memory care. But um, by the time we um, were able to get him discharged, take him to a clinic to get a COVID test, and then um, take him um, to the facility. The facility's um, um, administration had decided that nobody was coming into the community from hospitals, absolutely nobody. So then we decided, okay, well, next best thing, we're gonna have to have 24-hour care for him at home with this 93-pound, 92-year-old wife and he's like 250 pounds. So we did 24 hour care um, for a while and, and he turned out to be COVID negative, but we actually had to drive him down to a clinic, a hospital uh, on the south side of Chicago and they, they took six days to get the COVID test back from us. So the whole time it was like, everybody was just following the CDC guidelines, but there was a little in common sense. I wanted to get people transitioned out of hospitals as quickly as possible into the safest um, quality place. And, um, and I really have to tell you, I feel for hospital care managers. So I think that there's probably no more difficult job in America right now than being a hospital care manager. These people are heroes. They're just amazing. And they're working under dire circumstances. I mean, the hospitals are hemorrhaging money right now. And to keep people in beds when they're medically stable because you don't have an appropriate discharge for them is very difficult. And that's something that we've gotten really good at, fast transitioning, so that we're trying to really help reduce 30 day readmissions and quick transitions for hospitals. And so right now, my big goal for this year is to develop contracts with hospitals so we can help not only the clients, the patients that they serve, especially those that have limited social support, but also, um, you know, the hospitals. I mean, the money involved is unbelievable right now um, that hospitals have had to hire agency nurses, put people on, on sick leave, 14 um, day quarantines. And um, it's, it's very difficult. I think things are settling down in Chicago a little bit right now. Most of my friends are telling me that hospitals are fairly empty right now, which you can imagine that's costing the hospital a lot of money too. So 
I think the new horizon for all of us is to just really link arms with each other, with hospitals, with anybody that does anything in the world of um, care management in the community and hospitals, because I'm going to predict that, um, you know, more and more of healthcare is going to be done in the community and people are going to need somebody um, with the assessment skills to go in and anticipate problems before they happen. Um, I think a lot of hospitals think that home care is enough, but it often isn't really. You need to have somebody with good assessment skills that can go in, take a look. I mean, I'm a former ICU nurse. So I walk into somebody and I can walk in there and see 25 things that a, a lay person isn't going to see. I can see early signs of not tolerating medications, early signs of congestive heart failure, safety issues, dementia issues. We do a lot of collaboration with um, Dr. Wilson Bonatti. A lot of you know, it does excellent, excellent neuropsych exams. And so we have so many amazing people. I mean, Matt and his partner, um, uh, Lauren, I've been giving them so many referrals for um, Medicaid right now. And um, I'm, I'm talking to lawyers a lot. And, um, and Lauren Weldon and Matt Margolis are my go-to people for, um, for anything having to do with Medicaid planning. Um, they charge about half what the downtown lawyers do, and they do the best quality job. Um, uh, just amazing. I'm so impressed with them. And um, also, I have to say, um, you know, Cass, that Accord Hospice has been really helping me with a couple of clients lately, too. So um, I love working with all of you guys, and um, I, it just warms my heart to see that you guys care about these patients, these people that are struggling, following, falling through the um, gaps in healthcare. And I know, Karen, Karen, you probably still work in the hospital, don't you? So you see the front lines like none of us do. And this is a really historic time. And um, I'm predicting that um, the field of patient advocacy is really going to grow right now a lot. Because today in America, if you don't have a patient advocate, you are at risk. And um, if you don't have family around to help you, you are at risk. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to give a shout out to every single person out there that's front lines, the home care companies. I mean, Pete, your home health care company, you know, all of, all of us are working our tails off right now to keep people safe. And um, to me, it's a very inspiring time. I, I feel like this is never going to come around again when we realized how precious our connections are. And um, I'm very, very proud to be a part of um, continuity of care and, um, and just, you know, all you guys that are doing all this front lines work, it's just absolutely amazing. So I think I'm gonna leave about five minutes early or ask people if they have any questions at yeah, all. It's a good time if somebody has any questions. You can wave your hand or just start talking. Terry, you want to put your contact information in the in the chat so everybody can grab it? Oh, sure. I will. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. So this Thank is uh, this is Pete. So I, I just want to just chime in here with uh, what, what Terry said. You uh, you really do, especially these times with all the ACOs and the MCOs and COVID mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. You need a patient advocate when you go into the hospital if you're having anything of any complexity, especially if you're going to need a post acute care these days, because mm -hmm. the patients just they um, they just don't know what to do. No, they don't know. And usually, I want to point out too. You guys know this: the hospital care managers and the care managers at the SNFs don't have any idea the difference in quality in home health care and home care. They have no clue. Just yesterday, I had to stop um, somebody being sent um, to a home health care company that I knew was not high quality. And um, we all have to stand firm in advocating for our patients and saying, no, I don't want them to go there. I want them to go mm -hmm. there. You know, especially, especially with all the alternative payment models and stuff going on. So yeah, a lot of yeah, times yeah. the patients have no idea that their discharge plan is already predetermined. It's not necessarily what's good for them. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Um, anybody else have a comment or addition to that? Thank you, Terry. That's excellent. Sure. Thanks yes. for all you do, Terry. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you all.